Okay, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. Um, thank you for being here. And uh, this is Sasquatch's first webinar of the 2022-2023 crop year. So uh, thanks for joining us uh, a couple of weeks before Christmas. I'm Dallas Carpenter. I'm the communications manager uh, with Sasquatch. Um, before we get started here, um, I just wanted to uh, put a plug in for a couple of uh, programs we have here uh, coming up. Um, so um, we're going to be having our uh, Think Wheat meetings, our in-person Think Wheat meetings um, once again. Um, so we're going to be heading out on the road to Esteban on January 24th, uh, Lumsden on January 25th and Kendersley on January 26th. Uh, so we will be joined by well-known speakers, uh, Marlena Barsh, uh, who will be covering the market outlook for spring and uh, Durham, uh, spring wheat and Durham in 2023. Uh, Mario Tenuta, Jeff Shano, and uh, Sherry Streithorst. Uh, they will be covering soil fertility and nutrient usage efficiency. Uh, Randy Kutcher and Kelly Turkington, who will cover disease management, <coughs> and uh, Tyler Wist, who will cover pest management. Uh, so registration for all three meetings is now open, and so you can go to our website, sasquatch.ca, to access the links for the registration forms. And there we go. I also want to mention our uh, Sasquatch AGM. Uh, the registration is open for that, and that's going to be on January 9th at 10 a.m. And so you can register for that and for all of the annual general meetings for all the uh, crop commissions, uh, which are going to be held the uh, week of the uh, crop production week in Saskatoon um, at uh, Prairie Land Park. And so I should mention that the um, uh, AGM uh, is going to be offered both in person and online uh, for those who are interested in it. So go to sascrops.com and you can uh, you can uh, register for the AGM for uh, Sasquatch and for the other crop commissions. And of course, uh, you can always contact us. Uh, so there's our uh, email, uh, phone, and you can always follow us on Twitter and our website is sasquatch.ca. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here, and um, I'm going to hand it over to, oh, hold on, I'm going to first introduce, uh, once I grab my notes again here. Okay. Um, I just want to mention quickly, too, that we're going to have a uh, so quick time at the end here of uh, Josh's presentation for some uh, Q&As. And um, so if you could uh, type your uh, Q and A's uh, using the Q and A function in the uh, in uh, Zoom here, um, I will get to as many questions as I can. Um, and um, I will try to, if there are people that would like to uh, ask their questions um, audibly, I will try to do that as well. Uh, but we might not get to everybody's questions. So um, again, uh, I, I apologize if we run out of time, but uh, we will do our best to get as many questions in as we can. So um, with all of that said, uh, now on to our speaker. Uh, Josh Linville is the Vice President of Fertilizer for Stonex Group, Inc. Uh, having grown up in Northwest Missouri on a family farm that raised row crops, tobacco and livestock, Josh brings a unique point of view to the fertilizer markets. With 20 years of experience in the fertilizer industry, Josh has operated in roles that have given him perspective on the market as a North American logistics specialist, a US-based nitrogen producer, and general manager of trade in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, Josh and his team, which spans around the world, have been hard at work educating the market on how to use fertilizer futures markets and not only to offset price risk, but also to be able to sell products to farmers well before fertilizer producers realize their physical sales programs. <laughs> so with that, Josh, uh, welcome and uh, please take it away. Appreciate it. Hey, really quickly, uh, that slide that you had on there for a while that showed the two combines in the wheat field, 
I don't know whose operation that was, but whoever's in that first combine it better be screaming at the grain cart operator because he's almost full. I don't see a tractor with a cart anywhere near him. Somebody's butt needs to be chewed. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, give me just a second to pull this up and share your screen. So, yeah, um, appreciate you having me on. And everybody, I want you to give you a heads up. This doesn't happen very often for me, but I am currently just north of Miami, Florida, uh, attending a conference. I gave a presentation this morning, very similar to this one, talking about the fertilizer market, giving the farmers an update on what is going on. Why is it going on? So I came up to my room here to knock this out. That's why you got the background the way it is. And I'm not gonna lie, as I'm looking over the top of my monitor, I'm looking at the Atlantic Ocean and I'm sitting here like, I just looked, uh, the water temperature 78 degrees Fahrenheit. As soon as I'm done with this, I might have to actually run out and jump in the water and just forget about fertilizer for a little bit. So that aside, um, first things first, uh, our, our compliance department makes us put this disclaimer up. What this effectively says is I'm here trying to give you information, some ideas, possibly strategies, some different points of view to look at. But ultimately, the decision is yours. Um, and there's a lot of people like me, and it's not just fertilizer, right? It's chemical, and it's seed, and it's equipment, and it's real estate agents, and all these other things out there. And the very, very vast majority of them are out there trying to help. They're trying to give you a point of view and give you some insight, give you a little bit of an edge on these marketplaces. But something I have really, really been driving home this year is that at the end of the day, the decision is yours. You know, when I sit here and I talk about fertilizer, I sit there and say, oh, I think this one's dropping. I think this one's going up. I think this is happening. I think that's happening. That is my opinion. That is my point of view. It might be right. It might not be. At the end of the day, let's say we do something, we develop a strategy, we put it into play and it doesn't work out, that banker is not coming to me. If you lock in your chemical and your seed and all this other stuff and the price of corn drops or wheat drops or whatever the case may be, well, you're the one that has to answer it. So always remember, I think the vast majority, I would give everybody the benefit of the doubt, even though I probably shouldn't. But we also have to keep in mind at the end of the day, we need to own our decisions. And with markets as volatile and ridiculous as they are, I think this is more and more important. So with that aside, let's jump into it. I always like starting with this because whether it is a conscious or a subconscious bias, your positions determine your point of view in the marketplace. And this does not matter what marketplace it is. If I am long urea, guess what? Most of this presentation is probably bullish nitrogen. And if I am short phosphate, I'm probably bearish phosphate. So I like to be open and honest with it and just tell you, here's where I sit, everybody. Physical fertilizer, nothing. We don't touch physical. I don't have a long or a short. Fertilizer paper, futures, same thing. The customers that we work with, and we trade a tremendous amount of paper, we do not hold a long or short paper position. Now, the day will come. We're actually working with the CME, trying to make the uh, trade size smaller so we can bring more of the farm gate. And in order to bring all these uh, the, together, there might be a time where I'm long or short. I will be more than happy to be honest and say, here's where I sit, roughly speaking, today. But as of today, I am not longer short. I will not even allow myself to trade fertilizer stocks. And let me tell you, I left a boatload, I'll say boatload for not knowing the entire audience. I left a lot of money on the table by not investing in fertilizer stocks back in 2020. When all this stuff happened, the derecho event and the Arctic blast and everything else, we know where fertilizer stocks were going to go. Prices were going sky high. Of course, stocks were going to go high, sky high. But it's more important to me rather than make a little bit extra money to be able to be on here and say, guys, I'm as unbiased as they come. That does not mean I am always going to be right. Far from it. But when I give you my point of view, it is just that. It is my point of view. I don't have skin in the game. I am just looking at the market and reading the tea leaves as I see it. So diving into the marketplaces, everybody always asks, how in the world did we get here? What happened in order to get us to where we are today? Because for the longest time, for years, fertilizer prices were very, very low. And the prices didn't have a whole lot of volatility. Well, we've got to go all the way back to that summer of 2020. And listen, I'm not going to go through every single one of these. I'm just going to highlight these, uh, these big ones. And the single biggest event that happened was in that August 2020 period. The derecho event and COVID checks being sent out throughout the U.S. The reason for that is before the derecho event, grain prices were not real good. And farmers didn't have a lot of money to spend. And when they started to look at next year, 
and they started to look at their balance sheet. It did not look pretty. There was a lot of red on those balance sheets. There was no demand for fertilizer. Farmers were sitting there screaming at their retailer, don't you effing call me. I don't have the money to spend. I'm not going to make money anyway. I don't want to think about it. Get the hell out of my house. But what happened? Derecho came through, knocked down some of the most highest producing acres in the world, destroyed the crop. There was nothing left. It's not that it got laid over and we had to run the combines a mile and a half an hour. It destroyed it. Grain prices started to jump significantly. Farmers went from next year's balance sheet looks like crap to, hey, we've got demand looks, you know, we, we, we're going to be able to make money. We need to grow a crop. And then those COVID checks came at about the same time. So not only can we make money next year, I've got money burning a hole in my pocket. It was the single biggest and quickest demand turnaround in the fertilizer market's history. And then we've been playing catch up ever since. Uh, February, United States natural gas prices skyrocketed. The Arctic blast reached all the way down to the Mexican border. And you would have thought the world had come to an end because the Texans started to get a little, tech, or get a little chilly. The natural gas prices skyrocketed. And we shut down a tremendous amount of our nitrogen production. We were already tight with the demand turnaround, and we lost a lot of production right before spring. Now, we got through spring, but prices were rallying. We wiped out inventories. We were down to zero. August, Hurricane Ida. Except two days before that sucker hit landfall, it was not a hurricane. And if you listen to the Weather Channel and meteorologists and stuff like that, everybody was in the same. This isn't a major storm. It's going to be maybe a category one when it comes ground. It's nothing to worry about. When it hit ground, I think it was a category four. It was the most destructive hurricane we had seen since Katrina. Now, thank God we did not see the same devastation we did during Katrina. But the problem is, and what we learned afterwards, is that it wiped out the electrical grid. Some of the single biggest nitrogen production plants in the world were shut down for weeks. Product was already tight. It got worse. Uh, fast forward all the way to Q1. Russia invaded the Ukraine. And all of a sudden, while the world's militaries refused to have a direct contact with Russia, world businesses, industrial sector, all stopped doing business with Russia. I mean, we had Starbucks and freaking McDonald's pulling out. Apple started pulling out. All these companies said, fine, you're going to do this crap. We're pulling out. We're no longer supporting Russia. And we really thought that Russian exports of fertilizer were going to be the same. We thought nobody would do business with them. And with Russia being as important as they are, prices spiked further. But we got to Q2. Farmers started to tell the story. Demand ultimately always determines the story. And farmers have been trying to say, guys, look at P&K. It makes no sense. I've got plenty in my soil. I don't need to apply more. I will mine the soil and it won't hurt me too bad on yields. And given where everything is today, I'm going to do that. We talked about all the way through winter, and a lot of markets said farmers are full of crap. They're not going to do that. Yes, they did. And not only did they cut back on their P and K applications, we also saw corn acres drop significantly. Now I'm going to talk a lot about corn, and I'm sorry about that. But the fertilizer market focuses on corn. That is just the way that this North American marketplace is. And it's not to sit there and say wheat is not important. It's not to say beans or anything else is not important. But the main focus is on corn. So we have to look at it from that perspective and have a better idea of where things are going. But as I said, P and K demand was down, corn acres dropped, so then hydro's demand went down. All of a sudden, this thing had a lot more weight on it. All of a sudden, prices started to fall. Uh, Russian exports, we thought were going to be near zero. Well, we've quickly found out March, April, they were actually about normal. Uh, Russia was building politics around the world using fertilizer, using oil, using energy. Brazil, India, Central American countries, all these places start to step up and say, whoa, 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 you mean you can guarantee me fertilizer supply at a discounted rate if I pay you in rubles? Screw the U.S., screw Canada, screw Europe. I'll be your huckleberry. And then, you know, like I said, corn acres dropped. Uh, we got into the summertime. European natural gas prices started to rally. That meant the cost of production there skyrocketed to a point that production plants couldn't continue. And we saw that production rate drop from 100% all the way down to 15, 30%. Guys, the newest entries on the list, like I said, the European nitrogen uh, production, natural gas prices got all the way to $100 an NMBTU after being five or $6. And everybody said, there's no way it'll ever fall, except it did. And values fell all the way down to the lower 30s. And all of a sudden, some of the production turned back on. They got to about 50, 60%. Uh, the Nord Stream pipeline. 
we kept holding out hope that Putin would be removed from power, a Western friendly uh, leader would be put in place, and they would start moving natural gas back to Europe, creating a situation where prices fall, European production turns back on, prices fall further. Well, I'm guessing Putin probably heard that from a few people as well. And all of a sudden, somebody blew up the pipelines. And then North America logistics. And I know you guys are awfully far north saying, I don't give a crap what goes on in the U.S. You need to. Because, guys, we are linked together. We are one market. I know we always look at each other like we're two separate entities. We are together in this thing. And when we do something from a U.S. government standpoint that's really, really stupid, unfortunately, you guys have to bear the brunt of it as well. Our North America logistics rail and barge absolutely affects your prices up there. With everything that's been going on and all the things we continue to see that worry us going into the future, guys, these markets are almost impossible to forecast. Uh, I've got some friends that are traders and they're like, I don't want to trade this anymore. It is too volatile. It is too uncertain. It is too dangerous. Some of the biggest issues we're watching right now that kind of affect almost everything out there. Number one, like I said, the river situation some of the lowest water levels on the U.S. waterways that we've ever seen in history. Why does that matter? Barges are still moving. They're still moving product. It doesn't matter. Now, yes, dredging operations, the Coast Guard, the river operators, things like that, they have done a phenomenal job of keeping traffic moving under some of the hardest situ situations they'll ever work with. But the problem is that tow, that ship, needs to make so much money per day. And if that ship's barges have to have less tons per barge and you can take less barges per trip, well, they're still needing that exact same number of dollars. And if you're taking less tons, that means the rate of per ton goes up significantly. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And I don't see a short fix in sight. Yeah, some of these Midwest rains that we're seeing come across, it's helpful. It absolutely is. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, what we need is a lot of moisture up where you guys are, uh, Northern Plains, U.S. And moisture that comes through right now, it doesn't come through as rain. It's ice. It's snow. So we won't see the benefit of that in the river systems until the spring melts. So this is a situation I think is going to continue to follow us through spring. And that's assuming you have a tremendous moisture up north. Uh, it's no guarantee that by springtime this thing will be healed. We'll have to watch this because this hurts. U.S. Rail. You've heard about the strike. You've heard about the threats. Now, I know I have continued to maintain, I thought the railroad workers and railways had come together. Eventually, they'd come to terms, no problem, until Washington, D.C. decided to stick their stupid nose in it. They took a vote and said, we are going to forbid the rail workers from striking. They are not allowed to. And guys, I don't know if you ever met somebody that works for the U.S. Railroad. They don't take kindly to being told what to do in that type of manner. Yeah, they may not strike, but everybody may get sick on the same day. Locomotives may have trouble that day and have to take it back to be repaired. Maybe the rail car just uh, broke down. They got to take the whole train back. They can slow this thing down tremendously. They can, they can monkey wrench this thing in a very, very big way. And that, this isn't even on the fertilizer side. This is so many different products out there. I mean, walk around your house and look around and tell me how many things are not touched by rail in one form or another. We cannot lose rail. It is too darn important. If we do, our entire continent's gonna suffer tremendously. Again, if we were to lose barge, that's gonna make your prices inland go up so much more because the cost of moving it from point A to point B. If we lose rail as well, we have to seriously have a talk about can we move enough product to get ready for spring season. And I don't say that to try and scare everybody, but I think it's a very, very real possibility that we need to keep in the back of our minds. The last, uh, the third one, European natural gas prices. Like I said, they went from single digits to 100, and they went down to the low 30s, and now they're back into the 40s. This is going to continue to dictate global nitrogen prices because if these values continue to climb and they shut down production again, prices are going up. I'll show you a graph here in a little bit that shows you the correlation between their gas price and null urea prices. European natural gas right now is the focal point of global nitrogen values. And lastly, Russia, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the government put out a, uh, a duty on fertilizers being exported. Now there's no duty rate up to 450 bucks and it's 23 and a half percent on anything above 450. Now, I don't think this affects global uh, values, 
because at the end of the day, I don't think this will come anywhere close. You know, $450 is well above any Russia uh, produced cost of production. So it doesn't affect theirs, which means that their production doesn't change, their exports need to continue because they can only take so much. So global supplies don't change. At the end of the day, I think anything over 450, that is a cost that Russian companies will have to bear, not the world market. Basically, he is forcing the Russian companies to pay for this Ukrainian war. But what if he makes it worse? What if he removes this nothing below 450? What if he ramps it up? Guys, Russia is incredibly important on the global scale. They are 5% of urea production. They are 9% of UAN, 6% of phosphate. One out of every five tons of potash is produced and exported from Russia. They are incredibly important and they are worth our attention. Now jumping over to urea, this is a world phenomenon, guys. This is not just a North America thing. This is not just North America producers taking the price up. There is a very, very, very strong correlation between global price points and ours. We're a world economy, guys. Whether we want to admit it or not, we are a part of the world economy. And when prices get too out of sync or they get too close or anything like that, the free markets start to move that and they bring it back in line. Our main focus is today, and this is much more of a global point of view than is anything here domestically, but it's European production, Chinese exports, Russian exports, and then urea price versus UAN and anhydrous. Now, Europe, I talked about how important they are. A lot of people sit there and told me, oh, Josh, who gives a crap? Western and Central Europe, they're 5% of global urea production. Who cares? You're right. That's only 5%. Urea is a 225 million ton market per year. 5% is 11 million. And they're operating right now at around 50%. That is five and a half million tons per year that is still offline on an annualized basis. That is a lot of tons are removed. That keeps the world much, much tighter. And not only do we have to worry about the supplies that are being lost, do you think European farmers are just going to sit there and say, well, I guess I'll just go without urea this year? No. Not only did your supply drop, your demand grew. So this is absolutely something that's very high on our radar. And again, that graph I told you about, this blue line is the Henry Hub. This is basically the U.S. natural gas price. And there's a lot of people trying to sit there and say, oh, Henry Hub is the one that's determining pricing. Well, when you look at it, it doesn't really move. I mean, you're talking about the difference between like $3 and $9 in MMBTU. But look at that green, the Dutch TTF. And the red is your NOLA urea, New Orleans, Louisiana. There is a lot more correlation between your Dutch TTF and your urea values. And if I were to overlay this with Middle East or Egypt or any of these other places, it'd be almost the exact same thing. Guys, right now, the focal point of this marketplace is Europe. Now, China is just as important. China has typically been a five and a half million ton exporter per year. At least they were until last fall. Last fall, the Chinese government came out and looked at the world and said, you know what? Global supplies are extremely tight on urea. Prices are extremely high. No more exports. Keep it home for Chinese farmers. Not only will we guarantee the supply for farmers, that'll also force prices lower. And they were right. And it's China. So when the Chinese government tells you to do something, you listen and you do it. You are a Chinese citizen first before anything else in your life. So their exports went down to very, very low. The only stuff they got exported were some of their neighbors that was allowed to go. Now, starting August, uh, we have seen them kind of loosen those export restrictions. They're starting to send out a little bit more. But you look at that through August through September. Normally, as we are getting to the end of September, they've exported almost 4 million ton. This year, not quite 2 million. Russia, this has been the fortunate thing. For those wanting lower prices, more supplies, Russia has actually been a win. While we don't like the idea of Russia being able to profit off of this, at the end of the day, the world needs its fertilizer flows. Its exports are lower than normal, but not nearly as much as what we see from a place like China. So this has been a win for us. This has helped prices come off. Now, again, um, I should have showed this from a wheat form, but again, with so much of the marketplace focused on the corn, it's important to look at that. And what this does, if you haven't seen this before, I am not an advocate for looking at just flat prices because flat prices lie to us. 
if I go to any farmer out there and I say, Hey, you know, would you, do you like $6 corn? They said, yeah, but I'd like 650 better. Or if I get you 650, I like seven. Same thing for fertilizer. It's never cheap enough. Everybody's like, well, would you rather have high price corn or low price? Everybody says, I would rather have high price. What this graph looks at is the ratio. And when I look at farming, I just see it as manufacturing. It's inputs and it's outputs. And I want to lock up both of those together and lock up the value. And here's where it can lie to us. Back here, late March, December corn was sitting at almost $6.50. But Nola Urea was sitting at almost 900. That ratio was very, very near 140 bushels to pay for one ton of urea. Fast forward, December corn drops all the way down to $6 a bushel. We don't like that. Look at Nola Urea, 468, almost $470. The exact same ton of urea. Today, we are spending 70 bushels of corn to pay for one ton of urea versus 140. We are spending half the bushels, even though our price has dropped by 50 cents a bushel. As higher prices is not, higher price corn is not always the answer. Higher price wheat is not always the answer. These are the opportunities we look for to lock up the value. And we've got to lock in both sides of it, right? If we lock in the input, we don't think, do anything on the output and that price goes to hell, we've lost and vice versa. But again, I'm not saying this works for everybody. I'm merely saying this is a different point of view on how to look at the marketplace. And if we had gone back here to August, September and somebody said, we're going to drop all the way down here to 70, I would have laughed in your face. There's no way. Today, this is actually going to be a solid value. Now, going forward, I won't bore you with each one of these. Uh, I can tell you my biggest bullish factor today continues to be actually a North America urea remaining significantly cheaper than UAN anhydrous. And we're starting to hear some anhydrous spring programs getting announced today. The values are high enough that urea remains extremely low. And I think we are going to see a tremendous amount of demand switch from UAN and anhydrous over to urea to help uh, basically to go and say, fine, if it's going to be that much cheaper, that's what I want. But the bearer side, we could absolutely see European production restart. As quickly as we saw it come from 15 to 30% up to 50, 60%, if European natural gas prices were to fall significantly again, more plants can turn on, more tons come online, all of a sudden the world has gained supply, lost demand, and prices can fall just that quickly. UAN, again, I'm going to start repeating myself a little bit because nitrogen all works together. But if you take a look here, again, we are a part of a global market. What happens halfway around the world absolutely matters to us here at home. And when you look, Black Sea is Russia. There's not a whole lot of UAN points out there that we can track on an active basis. But look at that correlation. What happened globally happened here, and what happened here happened globally. Our main focus is, again, shock. It's European production. It is nitrogen uh, price spreads leading to demand switches, and then ultimately what CF decides to do. They are... CF, I'll cover this one right now. CF is about half of the UAN production. And when they come out with their program, everybody else typically, unless there's a weird thing going on where they want to get ahead or put sales on or something like that, unless there's pressure out there, everybody else follows CF's lead. And that's just what you get when it's a smaller market like that. And, you know, unless anybody on this call wants to go in to get through with me and uh, come up with four or five billion dollars to build their own nitrogen plant, that's the way it's going to be here for a while. They lead the charge. Now, Price ideas have been falling. They get a little more desperate to make sales, but it's not nearly as much as it needs to be. But looking at European exports, and actually I'm going to say this from more of a Russian perspective. Look at Europe. One out of every five tons in the world is produced in Europe. And I said that uh, urea, what, 225 million ton marketplace? UAN is only 35 million uh, tons. And the reason for that is that, you know, farmers around the world, the less developed countries, you know, you can hand them a sack of urea and they can just take their hand and just throw it out there. We've all seen the pictures. And that's exactly how so much of the gag world does it. With UAN, though, you don't see a whole lot of pictures of somebody with a five gallon jug of UAN dipping their hand in and just flicking it on the crop. That's not how they work. So UAN is a much, much smaller marketplace globally. It's huge for us, but small in the context of the world. But Europe accounts for 20%. And then look at Russia, almost 10%. And Russia, because of their natural gas flows or lack thereof to Europe, basically they have got their finger on almost one third of global production. It's a big deal. Again, Russia seems to be leading the charge. 
Now, again, talking about this nitrogen spread, looking at New Orleans, Louisiana, and we look at this price, we look at that location because it's the most liquid market for fertilizer in North America. It's the best place to look at week to week differences. What this graph does is it looks at the urea price and the UAN price. It breaks them both down to a price per pound of actual N because that's what you care about. You don't care about the other crap that's in it. You care about the nitrogen nutrient. And it looks at the differential. And look at that, guys almost 32 to 34 cent premium for UAN right now in NOLA. Now you may not be seeing this inland. They both have different um, logistical costs. Obviously they both have different application costs. There's different things inland, but this is what I watch just to kind of get a sense and just look at how much higher it is versus where it normally is this time of year. The US average application rate of nitrogen on an acre of corn is 150 pounds. And if the inland price is reflected a 30 cent difference, that is almost $50 per acre savings, switching from one to the other. I started talking about this back when it was 18 cents way back here. And I had a lot of people laugh at me and say, Josh, it's such a small percentage that's going to change. This is complete crap. Quit it. You're just looking for a story. I said, no, the problem is, number one, farmers are pissed. Demand always has their say, ultimately has the last say. And I think they're upset with a lot of things. That's going to play a part. And it's early enough in the season. This isn't like right before spring where prices skyrocket or the premium skyrockets. This is literally months ahead where farmers can actually make changes. And that's just continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden, a lot of those, you know, laughs and kickbacks have kind of pushed back and said, dude, I get what you're saying. My guys are talking about it now. I can tell you, I can't say from a Canadian standpoint, but from a U.S. standpoint, this is getting a lot of attention. UAN is starting to fall apart because there's so much demand switching over urea. Nobody wants to lock up UAN today. They're saying, why would I ever do it? It's finally enough. It's starting to break the UAN marketplace. And I don't think UAN is going to drop by hundreds of dollars. I don't think they need to sell that much, but it's at least something. It is the first fall we've seen in quite a while. Now, part of the reason why UAN is so high is because U.S. continues to export for the six months in a row, the U.S. has been a net exporter of UAN. Now, some of our stuff obviously goes up to you guys, but when you look at it, never in the history of UAN have we seen six months in a row we, were, we have sent more product export than what we brought in. Yeah, the CFs and Cokes and Nutrients and everybody else in the world, they may not be making a lot of sales, but the fact that they were able to sell it overseas means that they don't have as much as they have to sell here. And they are likely selling it overseas at a hefty premium because those guys are desperate. And where's it going? Europe. North America UAN is flowing to Europe to backfill the loss of their production. It is a tremendous number and it is not done. That means US and Canadian producers, they only have to sell enough to get through most of March. And once they had that sales book on, they can sit back and just wait because spring demand comes and they've got the market right where they want it. Now, as far as the ratio, it's not a good place, guys. Um, it was higher last year, but let's face it, that's not something we ever want to compare it to. Today, that ratio in the Gulf of Mexico sits at about 80 bushels for a ton of UAN. Back in 20, back in 19, less than half. Everybody was spending half bushels to pay for the exact same, same ton of UAN. We've been talking about this for a while and we've been trying to explain to these guys, demand will have its say. Demand is not going to like this. You guys have spoken and the market is finally reacting. So again, the bullish factors, the bearish factors here. My biggest one bullish for North America continues to be this North America export opportunity. If we continue to see a net export uh, seven months, eight months, nine months in a row. That is moving a tremendous amount of product out of our continent and leaves us short. And we still got a lot of demand. But the flip side, I think, I, I think the market is undervaluing how much demand can switch from UAN over to Urea. And Hydrus, I don't really have a whole lot to tell you other than it's way too damn high priced. Uh, the reason I don't have anything to really tell you is that we don't quite know what the fall season is yet. We need to have an appreciation for what's happened this fall before we can have an idea of what's going on in the spring. Now, I can tell you, this summer, prices dipped down to 900 bucks. 
And as of today, I have heard some early conversations, some early values starting to come out in the Western U.S. Corn Belt. And the values are around, say, $1,000 to $1,100, depending on who you're talking to. So it's going to start out about $150 short ton USD, higher than where the summer values were. At least that's what the early indications are. We'll wait and see if others follow through with it. But as we expected, we're not going to touch that summer low. It's going to remain high. Because right now we expect that we believe that the fall season was actually fairly decent. Um, I can tell you, my dad customer applies a lot of stuff in Northwest Missouri. The start of November was not hot. And all of a sudden, I, when I say not hot, we didn't get a whole lot put on. And then it turned wet, it turned cold, and we thought we were screwed. And it was going to be a really, really bad fall season. But fortunately, it warmed up, it dried out. Soil conditions have been perfect. We got everything on that we wanted to do. There are pockets of the uh, North America that are suffering because of dry temperatures, hot temperatures, things like that. And they're not going to have a good run. But overall, it's going to be okay. It's going to be enough to wipe out inventories, get comfortable, uh, get producers that are comfortable and help them keep price ideas higher. But going forward again, European production, industrial demand, and then what the fall demand is. And again, just to give you a sense of how big is Europe, 8.3% of a 232 million ton annual marketplace. That is 19 million ton. And they are currently running at 50% rate. That is what, nine and a half million tons lost. It's a big number, guys. In a recession, some people don't realize how much anhydrous goes into the industrial sector. And we learned this back in 2012. We thought we were bulletproof. Ag that doesn't have to worry about a recession because screw the recession, screw the rest of the world. They all got to eat. We're going to grow it. We don't get ever get touched. Nitrogen sure got touched because all of a sudden the recession hit and industrial demand started to wane because they didn't have to make as much because nobody was spending money. If the industrial and hydrous demand goes away and other nitrogen product demand goes away, that gets shoved in the ag market. And if you add in a lot more supply into the ag market and demand doesn't change, where do prices go? I'm not going to say we're going to a major recession. It's simply something I am watching. There, I have my concerns. When I, you know, we look around, just kind of watching mortgage rates, they are significantly higher. They're almost triple what they were. And I sit there and I went to go look at a brand new pickup, $70,000, $80,000. And I know my wife is constantly complaining the price of milk, the price of eggs, the price of bread. People are running out of money quickly. And if something doesn't change, the market is going to change it for us. So again, while this seems unlikely with a lot of some of the things we see out there, this is certainly something we need to watch because this can cut our knees out of us regardless of what's going on in our system. And again, to give you a sense of where anhydrous prices are versus urea. I know these are two different points. This is looking at the Western Corn Belt anhydrous price versus NOLA urea. But when you take the price all the way down to a price per pound of N and you look at the comparison, there's some seasonality. It kind of stays in the range. But all of a sudden, this red line is down here. That means urea is a massive, massive discount. Same thing. Looking at the ratio. Spending a tremendous amount of bushels. 2021 is about 100 bushels of paper a ton of anhydrous. Right now, it'd be about 200. We're double where we would normally be this time of year. And farmers know it. So again, going forward, um, European production falters again, prices are jumping. It's a very, very big deal. On the bear side though, recession, if we start to jump into one, if I'm a trader, if I'm anybody out there, I'm getting the hell out of every single position I possibly can uh, with nitrogen and hydrous included. Now, one thing before I jump over to phosphate, um, this is a question I get asked a lot. When is nitrogen going to normalize? When are we going to see prices get back down to where they were? You know, back when urea was 200 bucks a ton. I'm here to tell you it's not anytime soon. This is a lot in one graph. Let me try and explain it. Now, number one, this dotted line, it's up and down and up and down. Don't worry about it. That is just looking at the operating rate of plants. I want you to focus on the solid line, but even this one, not so much. What the solid line means is if every plant around the world ran at 100% capacity, it would produce this many tons. But if you guys have been around a nitrogen plant, they break down all the time. One of the biggest shocks of my life is when I worked for Coke, how often these plants shut down. They are old, 
They are dealing with high temperatures, with high pressures. Stuff breaks all the time. And trust me, nobody's shutting down their plant today, especially in North America with natural gas prices so low and fertilizer prices so high. If you shut down a nitrogen plant on purpose, you'd be fired. You would literally be fired. It'd be the dumbest thing you could possibly do. But because of all that downtime, this dotted line, it's a little more manageable. That's our effective capacity. Now, again, if we wanted to build a new nitrogen facility, a world-scale nitrogen facility, it would cost billions of dollars. and It would take years to build before we started producing our first ton. So we have a very good idea of what's going, coming online between now and 2025. That's that dotted line. Now, we also have a pretty good idea of what global demand looks like for nitrogen. That's that tan area down here. And look at what happens over the next few years. That dotted line in this tan area get very, very close to each other. And what that tells me is that we do not have a tremendous amount of extra nitrogen being produced over where demand is. Does that mean that we're gonna see shortages? No, I am not trying to bang that gong and scare you to death. But what I am trying to say is that this means that prices are likely gonna remain higher. And if we do see hiccups, if we see another situation where China stops their exports again, or Russia decides to stop their exports, or Europe uh, production rates fall out of bed, that does mean that the market is going to respond much more quickly and much more violently because we don't have that extra inventory being produced. We don't have that buffer like we used to. We used to have a lot of stuff just sitting around, just like, oh, if we had a production plant go down, that's okay. We've got this over here. We'll take care of you. The world we're getting ready to enter into, we don't have that. So like I said, I'm not trying to scare you guys and make you think, oh my God, I got to buy everything I can get my hands on. There will be opportunities. There will be lower prices. There will be higher prices. But we are entering a world where that supply and that demand is much, much closer. Jumping over to phosphates, again, it's a world market. Now, this is looking at Russia, China, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, and NOLA, U.S. gold. And again, there's a lot of correlation between all these global price points. And yes, there are periods where they get disconnected, but for the most part, they move together. We are part of a world economy in ag whether we like to think about it or not. And our main focus is today, Chinese export programs, demand for this fertilizer year and the cost of production. Now this graph, what this shows you is basically who the biggest producers are in the world. China is the number one producer and the number uh, the, one of the top two exporters of phosphate. And they're actually the top that map uh, exporter in the world. And that's been an issue. Um, U.S. already had a duty on Chinese exports. So those tons can't come here. And guess what? If we ban exports from China, those tons are going to really struggle to get to Canada. Stupid things we do affect you guys as well. And then summer of 2020, the U.S. government, in its infinite wisdom, decided, that, yeah, let's go ahead and allow a, a duty to be placed on Morocco and Russia. You see a problem yet? You start going through the top seven countries. The top seven countries control 90% of capacity of production. Five of those top seven countries control 90% of global exports. Of those top five countries that export, three of them can't come here. All that's left is U.S. North America production and Saudi Arabia. It has become a very, very controlled marketplace. If we had China that could come over here, Morocco that could come here, Russia that come here, we'd have more competition. But we don't have that. The U.S. government has put that in place. Now, there's been a lot of people talk about, well, why don't they get rid of it? It's a great question, and I don't know the answer. I really thought we'd see something, especially after CF lost their UAN case. I truly thought we would see a fight like we've never seen before, and that we would see them do away with that duty. But that has not been the case. We are effectively on an island right now. Now, Chinese exports, whenever they banned urea exports, they did the same thing on phosphate. Now, they have started to kind of catch up. Well, catch up is a bad word. They have started to export more than what they had been doing. But look at how far behind they are. Cumulatively, at this point of the uh, year, the three-year average, they'd be at 8 million tons exported. This year, it's four and a half. They're not going to catch up before the end of the year. That is a tremendous amount of tons that are not out in the marketplace looking for a home. But phosphate demand has actually had more of a, uh, a say in this marketplace than supply has. 
phosphate's historically high. And guess what? Like I said, you guys had a say in the matter. And you said something. You said, I'm not using this crap. Demand was down sufficiently. And that has been a big hurt on global prices. And we have seen global phosphate values dropping since late March, early April. And the hits keep on coming. Because when we look at uh, US plant gate, this is looking at Florida production economics. The two biggest variable input costs are sulfur and anhydrous. And once we hit Q4, sulfur prices dropped significantly. They had been very, very high price and they collapsed. And we're starting to see signs, not only did the December anhydrous price drop, but we believe we'll see more weakness in January, February, March. More production starting on, more supplies are showing up. So that price can start to dwindle down. This is not to say that we are gonna drop dollar for dollar because we are not a cost plus marketplace. It would be the same if I came to you guys and said, hey, what's it cost you to produce a, a, an acre of wheat? I'll give you a quarter more. That's not the way these worlds work. But what this does mean is that the price of phosphate can continue to drop. Right now, North America, Florida phosphate production cost is some of the highest in the world. And with limited rock supplies left, if all of a sudden that price gets below the cost of production, it'll shut down. We actually saw it spring of 2020. The price had continued to crater and got below their cost of production. They said, okay, we'll stop. We don't need to produce this stuff. We've only got a finite amount of rock left. I don't need to give this crap away. I don't need to lose money producing it. I'll just sit on it until the market comes back to me. So right now we are watching this just because it signals that this could be the low of the market. And today, a, a NOLA DAP barge is somewhere around 600 bucks, give or take, just a nice round number. The cost of production low to NOLA barge is somewhere closer to 425. Yes, there is margin in there, a healthy margin. But for those that might be saying, hey, I think the price of phosphate is going to drop two, 300 bucks a ton. It's historically high. It's going to fall through the floor. Anything's possible. I'm not here to sit there and say it isn't. But we could absolutely, if we drop this price 200 bucks a ton, you better believe we are going to see producers kick back and say, nope, I'll just shut it down because they won't produce at a loss. Now, the ratio is something we need to watch because we do have our prepay coming up, you know, uh, the last week of December, first couple weeks of January. While prices are still extremely high, the ratio has actually improved significantly. Uh, it was 140 here during the summer months, and here we sit at 100. It is a stupidly far cry from the 60 it was back in 2019, but this was a extenuating circumstance. This is getting back in range of recent years, and this is so much better than where it's been. I am expecting we'll actually see a little bit more of a demand boost than people are expecting. Uh, the farmer's been sitting there saying, I'm not using, I'm yet not using it, I'm, I'm going to walk away from it. I think deep down, a lot of guys are going to look at it and say, you know what, my grain is actually looking pretty darn solid right now, and phosphate's come off quite a bit. I think I'm actually going to take a hard look at it. I need to spend money anyway. I can tell you, um, leading into this fall, my dad usually applies his PNK in the fall season. My advice to him as he was in harvest was hold off. Don't buy it. If you feel confident you can get your stuff on in the winter or next spring, wait. He said, I, I feel comfortable with that. I said, okay, we wait. In the last week or two, I started telling him, you better keep a very close eye on your replacement cost because I'm going to call you here fairly soon and tell you to pull the trigger. I'm starting to feel a little bit more. I don't want to say bullish, but I don't think the price line is going to last forever. But going forward, China, being the largest producer and one of the largest exporters, we need to watch them. If the government comes out and says, hey, we're banning exports again, that's going to rally the market. But on the flip side, demand repays my number one. If demand comes in and we find out fall is complete crap, and I, I believe that's the case, winter demand stays kind of neutral and spring is another scale back, price is going to remain under pressure. Lastly, on the potash market, this is a market that's typically very, very boring. It, the price just doesn't change. It takes a long time to cycle up and cycle down until what we've experienced since early 2021. Now, luckily, after we peaked just above $800 a ton, Prices have been sliding. This occurred late March, early April, and it's been sliding almost every single week since then. Demand had its answer. Four things I'm watching, Lithuania, Belarus, Russian exports, new supplies coming, and demand. Now, number one, for those of you that don't know, uh, that little red dot is where Lithuania sits. Don't feel bad if you didn't. I didn't either. Why do you think this map is here? It's to remind me where it sits. But Belarus is the number three exporter of potash in the world where it was. 
when Russia invaded Ukraine, everybody started picking sides. Lithuania sides with the EU, with the Western world. Belarus sides with Russia. Belarus's biggest shortfall is the fact that A, they are landlocked, and B, they relied on Lithuania to move all of their potash out to the world through that country. Well, after Belarus took the side of Russia and started to assist them, on February 1st, Lithuania, the government stepped up and said, you know what, if you're going to support them, you're done. Our borders are closed to you. In one swipe of the pen, Lithuania took back the, their assets, took their rail, took their facilities, and shut off any sort of flow from Belarus out. Because what they would shoot is they'd ship it through Lithuania and out to sea. With one swipe of the pen, Belarus went from the number three exporter of potash to next to nothing. And it shows it on the exports. They were solid Jan, Feb, March, and some of this stuff had already been flowing out. And then look at what happened after that. The only things leaving in Belarus right now are being railed through Russia out to like China and those type of areas. On the flip side, Russia. We thought they were going to go to next to nothing back early in the year. They have been very, very close to normal until here the recent month, but this has more to do with a lack of world demand that has anything to do with export restrictions. And to give you a sense, here is why they are so important. And thank goodness we've got you guys to the north. Thank goodness we've got your production. You're a huge, huge part of the global production of potash. And take a look at the rest of the top four, Russia, Belarus, China. None of those countries like us very much. This, everybody, is a big, big problem. Like I said, demand is going to be a question mark. While prices are, have been coming off quite a bit, they are still historically high. And I know farmers are continuing to push back just from an emotional standpoint. But with grains holding, the ratio actually doesn't look too bad. Um, now, producers are starting to fight back. Last week at Mosaic announced at their uh, call and save mine, they were going to curtail production. There wasn't a lot of demand out there. Prices continue to slow. Uh, I'm sorry, prices continue to dwindle lower. So rather than just continue to ride this train into the ground, they just said, fine, we're going to cut production. We haven't seen the market react to flatten out or move higher, at least not yet. I'm not saying that it couldn't happen, but as of right now, we've not seen the effect they were hoping for. And then I talk about the new supplies coming online. Um, the big ones are in Russia. There's a couple of mines there that are being developed that will produce millions of tons. Once those things come on, all those tons are looking for a home. And don't forget about Belarus. They will find a way to the marketplace. Now, if I go back up here and show you the map, the current um, guesstimate is that they will build rail facilities all the way up here through Western Russia and around St. Petersburg and out to sea here. But that doesn't happen overnight. That's going to take years to build. But once they build it, and Belarus is not main cut from the world market, they will find their way back. So you get Belarus back, you get the Russian mines back, you get Canada producing at full force. Potash is the only one right now that I can look at and say we will be oversupplied in a few years and an oversupplied market sees prices down significantly. But again, that demand still has me a little bit spooked that we can see things turn around. Yes, we are at the higher end of recent year ranges, but it is in recent year ranges. If you go back to June, July, you say, Josh, we're dropping. We're going from 130 ratio down to sub 80. I don't believe you. And now that we've got some money to spend, we've got the year end taxes, things like that, we've got to worry about. Potash all of a sudden doesn't look so bad. Demand could be big enough. It surprises us. So looking at the bullish factors, um, as long as Belarus remains cut, you know, you can't lose your top three producer without seeing some support. But on the flip side, demand will have its say. If the price is still perceived as too high, demand won't step forward, prices will fall. And we'll wait and see how that plays out. Um, best thing I can tell you right now, the best thing I want to leave you with, I keep telling everybody this, do not let emotion dictate your decisions. And I get where you're coming from. You're looking at some of these prices, and I, it's across the scale, right? Uh, crap, I can't get my hands on a new tractor. I can't buy land to save my life. Nobody's selling it when they do. The price is so stupidly high, it doesn't make sense. Fertilizer's too high. Chemicals too high. Seeds too high. Diesel's too high. Blah, 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 blah. You can be angry. But at the end of the day, we have to make a decision. Don't let emotion dictate that. 
a lot of your operations are a much, much bigger than most of the businesses across North America. And we have to look at it from a rational point of view. Trust me, I say this from experience. I've made a lot of stupid, emotional, pissed off decisions. My wife will tell you if she was here right now. Yeah, he's made a lot of dumb ones. I can't, I don't even have to raise a finger to count the number of ones that have worked out when he's made a decision pissed off. It doesn't work well. Calm, rational decisions. And if you see an opportunity where you can lock in that input and sell that output, that is your best hedge today. If you can lock in both sides and that is profitable and you go on down the road and you look back and say, crap, I sure wish I would have waited. I could have made even more money. Okay, that's a decision I can live with because you still made money. And my worst decision throughout this 2023 crop cycle is that I could have made a little bit more money. I will take that as a win with the volatility and the risk that we are seeing in these marketplaces. I'll take that every time. So I will get off my soapbox. Um, questions, whatever, Dallas, hit me up, my man. Okay. A couple just came in here. Uh, Ashley Wilms has a question. Can this recording be emailed out to those who subscribe to watch today? Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, we'll take care of those uh, details later, Ashley. Um, so, um, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, all uh, worry about that. And uh, anyone who has questions about that can uh, email me or uh, contact the office here. And uh, I'll uh, talk to Josh about all that later. Um, so, uh, Brad Dempsey, um, do you track S and D of phosphorus in North America? Yes. And the reason I don't have a slide on that is because we're updating it right now. Uh, we always do, and this is for, I've got a farmer newsletter that I do. Now it's obviously a lot more affordable. The, pre the purpose of it wasn't to make a whole lot of money, but our bigger consulting package we do a quarterly webinar series. And part of that is rerunning, you know, inventories and production and demand and all this other stuff. I just don't have that updated yet. Uh, the, the slide I have is two and a half months old and I don't think it's pertinent anymore. So we track it. Uh, like I said, starting inventories were much higher starting this fertilizer year, which we consider a fertilizer year, July 1 through June 30, because the, uh, the spring demand just wasn't there because demand was down, we think 30 to 35% from what we expected. We carried a lot over. And so that is hanging on us. Uh, production has continued to churn out product. So we feel that supply is pretty healthy and demand is going to answer the questions. Okay. Uh, another one just came in here. Uh, what are you seeing for sulfur production uh, and demand going into 2023? I'll just be upfront with you. I, I don't know. Uh, sulfur is one that I need to do a better job of tracking. It's just a lack of time. Um, I'm getting more guys on the team and one of the first products that we are looking to add to the mix is sulfur. But right now we track the major fertilizers. It's uh, you know urea, UAN, anhydrous, phosphate, and potash. So afraid I don't have a real good look at sulfur. Uh, the sulfur information we get is more based on Florida phosphate production. Uh, Tim asks, uh, why are Canadian fertilizer prices so much higher than um, uh, FX and freight, freight and handling would indicate? Well, uh, first, we have to remember that if we're looking at historical prices of freight and handling, that doesn't count anymore. Historical is looking at river systems that aren't drying up. It's looking at rail systems that are running at uh, optimal capacity, not at reduced rates with risk of uh, strikes. So our logistical cost is significantly higher than what it's been historically. And with Canada being so much further away from a lot of these inlet points, that just, it's felt that much worse. Um, another thing, and I don't know if you're looking at this or not, if you're already considering this and saying, no, I've already got that moron, I, I understand the differences. But just in case you don't, I mean, obviously, when I talk NOLA, when I talk a lot about it, like on Twitter and things like that, I'm looking at USD and I'm looking at short ton. Obviously, you guys working it with CAD and working with metric ton, that might be another difference there. And if you're already consider, already using that and saying, I already got that, sorry, I'm not trying to talk down to you. It's just something easier to be to say and look like a moron than not say and wish I had. Uh, Don asks, why aren't new fertilizer um, uh, nitrogen plants being built in North America, especially in the 
shale oil fields area where natural gas is a waste product? Number one is the price. To build a new world scale nitrogen facility would probably cost somewhere between four and six billion US dollars. That's not a little bit of money. Uh, if you go to the investment world wanting to build it, they will say, yes, I like the economics of it, but I want a guaranteed return over the course of 20, 30 years. That's not possible. So they shy away. Current domestic nitrogen uh, producers, A, probably are a little nervous about what the longer term look is on things like natural gas. And B, why would they want to build a new plant? You put in new production, that adds more supply. You add more supply without demand changing, prices go down. But ultimately, I can tell you, I actually finished up a fertilizer study for Canada. And one of the big things we talked about is the Canadian government needs to consider allowing more old technology nitrogen production to be made within Canada. You've got the inputs. You are a very solid energy nation. There is no reason Canada should not step up as one of the world leaders of production. But much like the US, I can tell you right now, if I've got five bills sitting around and I'm wanting to build a nitrogen facility, I am not building in the US. We don't know what the hell we're doing two years from now, let alone 10, 20, 30 years down. Are they going to push more towards green or will the Republicans take charge and all of a sudden we're energy independent? It's a coin flip. You start looking globally. Where do I want to build it then? Where's cheap inputs? Venezuela, Russia. Mm -mm. I don't want to buy something on Amazon from those countries, let alone stick a $5 billion investment. Where you put it becomes very, very questionable. But I agree. Canada is a perfect candidate. It would be a phenomenal place to put it. It checks all the boxes that I have for a new uh, facility, except for the government. And I'm not, I'm not bad on your government, right? I'm just saying it's more of a green push, a little bit more of a environmental push, and they shy away from that kind of stuff. Uh, and speaking of that, uh, David asks, uh, is the U.S. looking at any fertilizer reductions due to fertilizer emissions similar to what Canada has been thinking about uh, regarding climate change concerns, nitrate level buildups in the U.S. watersheds and river systems? I sure hope they're not dumb enough to actually go through with it. Um, there's There has been talk of it. I know it's been tossed around in some different angles, but when you look at the kickback that we have seen overseas, and of course, the, you know, there's been talk of it of where you guys are too. I sure hope our leaders are not so stupid to look at that and say, you know what, we can do it better. It won't be the same here. I hope they're not that dumb. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's uh, 204. You got time for a few more? Yeah, man, I got nothing else. I'm, I'm good. Okay. Uh, so Scott asks, can you comment on the status of organic fertilizer markets, uh, for example, made from digestates? Oh, like uh, I'm assuming he's talking like manures, like uh, like from chicken farms, pig farms, things like that. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I'm all for it. Listen, I especially if we get it on the cheap, right? If you get a facility where they're just turning this crap out and they need to go somewhere, it's free or very, very cheap fertilizer. The one thing I would caution you on, it is the nutrient content of the manure. And I actually had a conversation with Guy earlier. I had a very similar conversation. I said, number one, manures are not big enough to actually sway the global fertilizer marketplace. But where you can get your hands on it, it's an enormous win. But the last thing I want us to do is to put on manure and sit there and think, I've got everything covered. I'm good to go. And then we get to the end of the year and we figure out our bushes are down 20 from where they should have been. And it's because we haven't been testing that manure. We haven't been soil sampling. And we figure out, holy crap, I'm deficient this, I'm deficient that. I'm all for it. I like it. I, I like anything that's cheap. And especially that, you know, it builds up the soil and everything like that. It's got a lot of good stuff with it. But I think we need to track a little bit more. I think what we save in the uh, fertilizer cost, I think we need to spend on soil sampling and testing. Right. Um, and then we have uh, someone who wants to ask their question live here. So I'm going to, David James, I'm going to allow you to talk here. Uh, just uh, if you can unmute, David, are you available? Okay. Well, David, I'm going to 
we move you as panelists here and then we're going to move on and we're going to ask the next question um it says hi josh can you elaborate on the old tech you're referring to that canada prohibits it's so right now obviously the push is for like green and blue and you know capturing carbon and things like that it, it's the cleaner technology and listen i'm not going to sit here and say that i'm fully opposed to those new technologies in fact i i'm still one that i'm kind of like the old boy scout right leave it in better condition than what it was when you got it and so if we can do this kind of stuff we can go forward and make nitrogen with this new technology that's better for the environment i'm all for it but the problem is i don't I have yet to see enough of it to be comfortable with that it is absolutely going to work, that there aren't problems with it. And the reason I say that is if we all of a sudden just flip a switch and we say, hey, the older technology, yeah, capturing the carbon, all this stuff, it's a little bit more of an inefficient and polluting system. And it just is, right? But we also have to figure out the other side. If we flip a switch and just everything we start doing is green and blue and environmentally and all this stuff, what happens if it doesn't work out? We don't have enough nitrogen. What happens if we don't have enough nitrogen? We don't make enough food. And all of a sudden we're reliving the 80s again, where all of a sudden we're on TV watching starving kids in Africa. So uh, that's the thing. It's just the older technology uh, methods of producing nitrogen versus the newer technology. I'm all for it. I, I, I like the idea of technology, trust me. I get all stupidly giddy when I see this autonomous tractor and stuff like that. I love this crap, but I need to see it actually work first. Right, okay. Uh, we have another question here. You've got a, a negative view on the import tariffs placed on Moroccan and Russian phosphate, which is understandable given its effects on fertilizer prices in the North American farm gate. But if we view through the same lens as we do other manufacturing and the effect of subsidies on North American competitiveness, is it not right to make up for that artificial barrier? Yes. And that's where I sit there and say, I'm not banging on producers for asking for these duties. And again, you talk about the environmental impact. When Mosaic digs a mine and they get done with it, they are forced to reclaim that land. And a byproduct of phosphate production is gypsum with a very, very slight radioactive tinge. So they pile the gypsum, they put dikes around it, and then they take care of it. And the same thing with the mines. They refill it, they reclaim the land. Some of the best golf courses in Florida are old mines. Mosaic has done a phenomenal job and that has a huge cost as millions, that's tens of millions of dollars to reclaim that land. Morocco, from what I've heard, I, I've never seen this in person but from what I understand, they're gypsum, they just dump it out at sea. They don't reclaim nothing. They don't care. So there's an environmental standpoint that I have a problem with it. You're absolutely right. It, it's one of those things where it, it's a perfect world. The way I wouldn't have done it, it would not have just been a one percentage rate duty it would have been a tiered system. When the price hits 350, or when it's X number of dollars over production cost, it's this much of a duty. And with this much higher, it's this duty. It's a, it's a variable rate, and it's depending on what the cost of production is. But we both know DC doesn't exactly work that way. I, and listen, at the end of the day, I have never blamed Mosaic for asking for that countervailing duty. I fully understood where they were coming from. I just didn't think that the duty was necessary as phosphate prices went from, you know, 250 bucks up, up to a thousand. Okay. Uh, Jason has a question here. Is the NH3 uh, anhydrous, I think that is, uh, mm -hmm. that is being produced from natural gas being priced off the European gas costs and not the US cost? Um, well, well, from a Europe standpoint, yes. But North America and hydrogen is being produced off of obviously ours. And that's where we don't think that the North American natural gas price has a whole lot of dictation on where values go. Because whether our natural gas price is $3 or $9, they're still making a boatload of money. They're going to produce every single ton they possibly can. But in Europe, if it goes from where we're at today, let's call it $43 in the MBTU, and it rallies to 75 because it's a really cold winter and they don't have enough supplies to get through and they start shutting down production because they can't make any money. That's what starts determining the marketplace. I hope that's the question. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I think, I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with that. Um, um, we have two more questions here, and I think we'll cut it off. Um, right. uh, what factors would remove barriers or encourage additional North American nitrogen production? I think some, again, I'm going to say this from a Canadian standpoint, just because I think it's better suited to put these plants in Canada than I do the U.S., just based on what you have for natural resources. Um, I, I think just simple support from the government, just the government saying, listen, we are not going to stand in the way of new nitrogen being produced. I, I think that would be a big one. Uh, I, I think maybe, and I hate to say this out loud because God knows they're making a hell of a lot of money and they don't need help but some sort of assistance from the government, maybe some low interest rate loans or something like that to help sit there and say, listen, we will help you with this. Uh, it, it could be the government investing in upgrading logistics. Uh, that was another big one. We need more trucks on the road. We need more rail capacity. That's where the governments ought to be looking to say, how do we increase the capacity of both of these avenues? So those are the things we come up with when we looked at it. Sure. Okay, and the last question here is from Greg. Uh, is the fertilizer industry watching the current situation in the Netherlands? Uh, what is your opinion on that situation? I'm uh, guessing by the Netherlands, you mean another situation where the government is trying to force them to cut or close farms and things like that. And yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's not really talked about because I don't think anybody really thinks this is going to spread. I, I think they've seen the reaction in the Netherlands from the farm gate what they have been doing. I think other countries, ooh, yeah, maybe we hold off on trying to do something. But just because they're scared away today does not mean they don't try it in two, three, five years. It's a fight we're all gonna continue to have. It's, once again, uh, the worst thing that you could ever hear is I'm from the government and I'm here to help. We need to continue to convince our governments we know what the hell we're doing. And we're trying to do it as efficiently and as clean as we possibly can but at the end of the day, if you don't let us do our job, there will be people that starve. And I've, I've had people that have come to me and sat there, you know, trying to have the argument, oh, we don't need fertilizer. We can do without. I was like, oh, you're right. Who are we going to kill? How, what billion people are we going to kill? It, and they get this shock look on the face. Like, that's a morbid thing to say. I was like, no, 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 no. Being shot is a hell of a lot easier than starving to death. Let's just put them out of their misery. You want to take out Africa? You want to take out wherever it might be? At the end of the day, we are tasked with feeding the world. We know how to do that. And we're constantly trying to do it more efficiently, less costly. We're trying to do all these things to make it better for not only ourselves, but for the environment. The last thing we need is for the government to step in and start screwing stuff up. They need to be working with us and taking the advice from us rather than trying to come to us and say, oh yeah, sure, I went to Harvard. I know what fertilizer is. I can't tell you how many companies I've heard from that buy inputs from farms and you sit there and try to explain something. They're like, listen, I, I understand, I'm from California. I have a garden in my backyard. I understand farming. There's a lot of people out there like that. Okay. Uh, with that, um, we're going to end things off here. Uh, thank you, Josh. Yep. Uh, that was great. Uh, as usual, we had you on last year and it was a big hit. And I think uh, it's uh, fair to say it was the same thing today. Um, we had a, a quite a turnout here. So uh, uh, thank you very much again. And um, uh, thank you everybody for attending today. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm just going to give another uh, uh, quick shout out here uh, for the Think Wheat meetings, uh, January 24th in uh, Esteban, January uh, 25th in Lumsden and January 26th in Kindersley. Uh, you can go to our website, sasqueet.ca, uh, for all the details to, for that. Uh, and I encourage uh, everybody to uh, sign up and uh, we'll meet you out there in person again. Uh, that's the first time in uh, two years. Uh, so that's, uh, that's exciting. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a great uh, thing to uh, be getting out and meeting farmers uh, in person again and uh, uh, as well. Uh, our AGM will be in person again this year too. So uh, once again, sasqueet.ca and uh, you'll get all the details there. So thank you very much, Josh. And uh, thank, thank you to everybody here today and uh, keep an eye on our website and our Twitter feed. We're gonna have more webinars uh, coming up in the new year as well. So uh, uh, on behalf of Sasqueet, thanks a lot and have a good day.